Hello, and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. Isadora Kozofsky is a documentary photographer based in Los Angeles. She is known for long-term projects centered on juvenile and mass incarceration, aging and relationships, healthcare, disability rights, and the impact of childhood trauma on women and families. Isadora began her career as a teenager, focusing on end of life and grief in Los Angeles. She takes an immersive approach to documentary photography, often spending months and years with individuals and communities to gain an insider's perspective. She was one of the first photojournalists in the US allowed inside a COVID nursing home and her coverage of COVID in hospitals and nursing homes for the New York Times was groundbreaking. She's a National Geographic photographer and a frequent contributor to the Times, the Times Magazine, Le Monde, and Time Magazine, among others. And she received a 2012 Inga Marath Award for her documentation of three seniors in a romantic conflict, which became a book titled Senior Love Triangle, published by Kara Verlag in 2020. Isadora is a very talented, very dedicated, and highly ethical photographer. So I present to you Isadora Kozofsky. Thank you, Jim. What, what an intro. <laughs> That's a very generous and very kind intro. Uh, good evening to everybody on the East Coast and good late afternoon to those of us in California and on the West Coast. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with everyone. I remember when I first held a camera. I'm sure a lot of people on this Zoom lecture, Zoom talk discussion, can probably also remember that moment. I was 13 and I held the camera in my hands and I knew that it's what I wanted to do with my life. I knew that when I held that camera, it was going to lead me to the depths of self-inquiry, to introspection, to connection with others, and to a deeper understanding of my own humanity and the complicated humanity of the people around me. My grandmother had just passed away she and I were very close. She was um, a safe figure in my upbringing. And I was coming out of a period of a sequence of profound traumatic events in my family. So the camera acted as this form of refuge for me at that point. It gave me the ability to engage in safe intimacy with people. And it taught me how to connect in a safe way and how to enter what I would now understand 16 years later as a covenant between us as documentarians and the people that we shadow, sometimes for an hour, sometimes for a month, and in many cases for me, sometimes for 10 years. The first project that I worked on was about people living in a hospice facility in Los Angeles. I was trying to understand my connection to mortality at that point. I was trying to understand the nature of dignity at the end of life. So I went to a, a nearby nursing facility and thanks to a music therapist, I was allowed to come in and photograph some of the residents. I shared this image, not because it's anything spectacular um, or anything special as a photograph. I really share it often when I know that I'm in a discussion with students. I share it mainly to root the rest of my presentation and to really anchor my understanding of documentary photography as a highly spiritual practice, a humanistic practice, but also a spiritual practice that you hone over periods of time as a photographer 
and as someone who sees the people that you shadow as your teachers, your teachers on life. This image to me really speaks to the foundation and the education I received over those initial three years sitting with people in hospice care. It was an experience of learning how to sit with people, something that we don't learn in a conventional classroom setting. How do we, as documentary photographers, as photojournalists, learn how to sit with people in some of the most uncomfortable, uncertain, and very painful moments of their lives? And how with them guiding us as teachers on their life, how do we find the moments of grace? So sitting down for me is the really the core of being a documentary photographer. Sitting down when the majority of people in our society would probably run. This is a very beloved woman in my life. Her name is Bianca. I met her in a cafe when I was 14. I was sitting alone and she approached me. She was four foot eight, born and raised in Chicago, a former flamenco dancer who was raised next door to Al Capone, for people who know who that is, you might be of a generation of knowing who that is. She was tough and direct a world traveler who ended up being a seamstress to Hollywood movie stars in the last 30 years of her life. She walked over to me and she said, honey, what do you want to do with your life? I was overwhelmed by that question because nobody had ever asked me and known in that moment that I was at the beginning of the greatest love affair of my life my relationship with my photography and with the people who have blessed me and the ability to be with them through their intimate lives. I told Bianca, I wanna be a documentary photographer. She looked at me with her hand over her chest and she said, oh honey, you'll never be lonely. Now, I think we all know that as photographers, we can be very deeply lonely people. And I think often people who feel deeply separate, remote, or have a kind of outsider subjectivity are often drawn to photography. But I think what Bianca was really saying is that photography was going to allow me to connect in places with people that I could never imagine. And that reality is so much more interesting than we could ever make up. She helped me and invited me into a world that became a point of connection and commitment for me, which for many years has been shadowing senior citizens. After a few years of visiting Bianca on Friday nights, listening to Billie Holiday and her insisting that I share her champagne with her, I saw three people one evening enter the gates of the retirement community. I was really struck by these three people. I saw a woman who I later learned was Jeannie walking behind William and Adina. I felt this separation and I just knew in the moment that they were people that I was going to photograph. There was something about her body language and gesture and this immediate intuition that I experience when I see people often within minutes who I know I'm going to shadow and no in the long term. So for a few weeks, I observed them from afar. I asked the people at the facility, at the retirement community, who they were. And one of the care providers said to me, oh, are you talking about the threesome? I was very intrigued. So I went ahead and I approached them and I began slowly sitting with them, acclimating them to my role, explaining to them what I wanted to do. I didn't really know where their story was going, but they knew that I was a photographer. And from there, they allowed me to accompany them on daily adventures and endless walking in East Hollywood, California. This was one of the first images I took of Jeannie and Will. At this point, Will was struggling with figuring out who he wanted to pursue a relationship with. He had been in a relationship with Adina, living in one retirement community. 
he was asked to leave that community. He moved into another and he met Jeannie and he just couldn't get himself to the point where he knew who he wanted to pursue a monogamous relationship with. And then over time, the women started to kind of accept um, in moments begrudgingly this kind of unconventional dynamic. And from there, I started to document what has now become known as a love triangle amongst these three people. When the work was first shared, the response mirrored in many ways the kind of reaction that these people received from those in the retirement community. Discomfort, a bit of shame. People were deeply uneasy with this kind of non-monogamous dynamic amongst three seniors. There was something that pushed too many boundaries, particularly in the way that we understand the agency, body sovereignty, and attractiveness of people as they age within our cultural framework. Over time though, people have definitely become more receptive to this work across the age spectrum and have come to see it um, as a reflection of each of our complicated relationship with intimacy. Each of us has dealt with some form of love triangle, whether it be literal or something more spiritual of entering a relationship with one person and holding on to the history of another. Something that I learned from my time with Jeannie Will and Adina was the importance of listening to the people that you're shadowing and understanding how they wanna be described and portrayed to the world. Really to try and absorb instead of project. Adina told me there are many different types of love when I asked her to kind of define the relationship that they were having. I think that's a really important lesson for us to be mindful that perhaps some of the labels and keywords that we're asked to assign to the people that we shadow are not necessarily the ones they feel best honors their story. When the pandemic arose, started, uh, erupted in March of 2020, I was on the heels of the first part of my journey with thyroid cancer. And I was sitting in my apartment recovering from a major surgery. And I was literally watching on the news and scrolling on my phone for hours these headlines about the impact of COVID-19 on people in skilled nursing and congregate living settings. I was completely heartbroken as I watched as thousands of people, even within the first month of the pandemic, perish in these facilities worldwide. When it came to Mother's Day, I knew that I couldn't keep myself from pursuing some kind of documentation about people impacted by COVID-19 who were residing in these settings. So I contacted about probably 60 to 100 skilled nursing facilities in Southern California in the lead up to Mother's Day, because I had this feeling that maybe one of those facilities was going to be holding some kind of means of connection between residents and their families at that point. I came upon a facility, Alexandria Care Center in Los Angeles, and found out from the people working there that they were going to hold a Mother's Day event. And that led me to this. This is Fabiola Toralba, listening to her family read the Lord's Prayer over Facebook Messenger on the other side of the glass. When I completed this story, I was grateful that I was able to even get close to Fabiola in this situation, but it really wasn't enough. And the kind of responsibility that I developed over years of working with these communities, I just couldn't sit it out. To me, it was unfathomable that so many of my colleagues could be so close to war when there was an active war going on behind closed doors in these settings with thousands of elderly people dying alone in these environments. So for about six months, I went back and forth with a healthcare corporation that runs a set of nursing homes, long-term care facilities in New Mexico. Initially, 
they rejected my idea of coming in and doing an embed in this facility, in any of their facilities. At that point, uh, there hadn't really been any work coming from inside due to media restrictions and just outright restrictions of visitors inside these kinds of confines. But I tried and I vehemently pursued these various decision makers, both on the side of the healthcare corporation and on the state level, because I knew that the state of New Mexico, the health department, the long-term care department would have to grant approval for access. And then finally they did after I appealed. And in August of 2020, when there really wasn't even a sense of when we would be receiving a vaccine, I entered Canyon Transitional in Albuquerque in a hazmat suit. And the first room that I entered was Jose Montoya's room. Jose is seen in this image, speaking with his daughter, Lily Ortiz over video chat, as Micah, his nurse, holds up the, the Zoom call. It's actually Micah, his CNA. I entered that room after having spoken to Lily Ortiz by phone and many of the families before entering the facility, there was definitely, as you can imagine, a hesitation, uh, a discomfort from both the facility, from the state, these concerns that the families would be angry that I was going to be allowed inside to photograph. In the last two years, both in skilled nursing and in hospitals, I've never received that kind of response. If anything, these families feel affirmed. They feel that their pain is affirmed. They feel that their loved ones are being honored and that their re reality is being written into history. So their fears never truly manifested. And if anything, the families felt even more connected to their loved ones in this process of knowing that their story was going to be shared. When I entered this room with Jose Montoya, who was a 94 year old World War II veteran and a career tax preparer in Northern New Mexico, I heard the door click behind me. And I remembered I had heard from the security team about going into the rooms. But I couldn't stay in the hallways because how could I really honor the experience of the people I was shadowing? How could I responsibly tell their story without really getting close to Jose and sitting with him and making him feel comfortable with my presence, given his serious illness, the uncertainty of what would happen? So I entered the room knowing that Yes, it was a great risk when you're working in a nursing facility where there are 70 people with COVID. It's not quite like working in a hospital setting where there is ventilation. And when that door closed, I felt my heart race. And I said to myself, what are you doing? And I sat down a moment later because I knew that I had to be there because I remembered what I had seen over the years, which is that the people that we shadow are always giving us more than we are giving them. The courage of Jose and his family to want to be shadowed in this situation outweighed my fears. So much of what documentary photography entails when you're working in highly sensitive situations and potentially dangerous situations is trying to balance risk and responsibility. And in this situation, I truly felt that I needed to sit down with him. I worked with a number of the CNAs as they navigated caring for an elderly population and a population of adults with disabilities. This was their way of sanitizing their masks at this point, putting them in lunch bags. This is Alice Begay. On our third day together, um, Alice is deeply close to her granddaughter. She had a little picture of her granddaughter, who's a teenager, 
sticking her tongue out inside her Bible that she shared with me um, on our first, our first day sitting together. So many of those in this facility thought that I was a ghost, almost jokingly, but maybe in a serious way too, because they couldn't imagine someone else coming in. But as the days progressed, they started to feel, as time affords, more comfortable with me. And in this situation, Alice was having a really rough time with the reality that she hadn't seen her family for a number of weeks, and she wasn't sure when she would be seeing them again. I met Sierra Cowboy, who's a 25-year-old young woman who became hospitalized after going into a critical state in Gallup, New Mexico. She and her father were airlifted, air, airlifted to Albuquerque, and she ended up in this skilled nursing environment to do rehabilitation. She's now at home. Her mother also contracted COVID, and she passed away from the illness. This is Alice Begay, covered in her blanket on one of the afternoons of us sitting together. And on the left, you have Leslie Riggs' hand holding her oxygen line. Leslie was a public school teacher for many years. And on the right, you see Micah leaving Jose Montoya's room. I truly believe that the people that we shadow sometimes choose us. I mean, they always choose us. It's a mutual choice, but sometimes there's just a way that people find you in these circumstances. And that was very much the case with Juanita Lujan. I saw her from Alice Begay's room. She was waving at me. And although I hadn't spoken to her family prior, I contacted them once I was already in the facility to inquire if I could go in and meet with her. So I entered her room and I sat down beside her and she told me about how she was really tired, but she was doing fine. I was really moved by so many of these older people's perspective in their situation. They were cut off from everybody that they knew, um, but they managed to hold on to a resilience to get through this period of isolation and unknown. After I did this work in Canyon Transitional, I felt that I had hopefully contributed to some kind of understanding of these elders' plight in this circumstance. But I knew intuitively that my work wasn't older, over because I was seeing so many of the communities that I care deeply about impacted repeatedly by the virus. So when the wave, the deadly wave of COVID-19 reached Los Angeles County in December of 2020, I knew that I had to be in the hospitals. I knew that I had to be in the hospitals in my hometown. So I entered MLK Junior Community Hospital with Sherry Fink, who is both a reporter and a physician and works at the New York Times in the investigations department. And we spent a number of weeks inside MLK's intensive care unit. There had been a lot of work about healthcare workers at this point, but there was very little about the people who were so gravely ill from a photographic standpoint. We had seen time and time again, the sweat filled images of healthcare workers, their toil and their bravery, which was so deeply important. But what about the people who were dying in these environments? Who were they? They must have a face. And I was very much driven to be able to persuade the hospital to allow me to work more directly with families to put a face literally to this very anonymous group at this point. This is Emilio Virgen, who was hospitalized for COVID after presumably contracting it at church. 
Emilio was a minibus driver who used to drive senior citizens to and from their doctor's appointments. He was a father of four and he was a lover of his many lemon trees. He was definitely a man of faith and had a special connection with God as his daughters described to me. Working with people in intensive care was certainly in many ways an unprecedented experience in, forms of, in the form of connection. Many of the people who I shadowed, uh, with the exception of Edith, who's shown in this image, Edith and I spent a lot of time together. I, was, I would sit with her sometimes for hours. Edith contracted COVID at her job working as a housekeeper. She has since recovered and is back with her family. Here you see uh, an image of a, a nurse about to cover Emilio Virgen um, in his room. And this is Mr. Torres after waking up upon being extubated. He was 30 when he contracted COVID and had a very intense and critical response um, that was able to pull through. Something that I wanted to emphasize before I spoke about Edith and Mr. Torres, I wanted to say that the unprecedented experience that I had was working with people who were not awake while I was photographing them. So working with their families, speaking to their families by phone, trying to get a sense of who that person was, I tried to connect when there wasn't that initial locked eyes or that initial conversation that you have with someone when you enter their living room and you sit down and they tell you about their life. There's so much of the work that we do is about listening. It's about listening and being radically present, but it's also about listening in every way imaginable. But working with people in intensive care, there really wasn't that direct listening. So I had to find a way of illustrating what was a horror in a way that at the same time felt conducive to connecting to the essence of the person who I was shadowing. So much of the work that we do is sitting, as I've described, being patient, and many times the most unexpected moment comes up after a number of hours of sitting and absorbing and sometimes just looking at a wall or the movement of people back and forth. I don't really believe in anything like wasting time um, as a storyteller when your studio is life and you're constantly absorbing, taking in, being receptive to whatever's going on in the environment you're immersed in. And that will all eventually make its way into your photography. Because I truly believe that the, more, the deeper the relationship with the people you're shadowing, the more intimate your work will be. And ultimately the more meaningful the process will be for you as a person and particularly in these environments and these circumstances that are so harsh and filled with so much inequity and injustice. I took this image um, during hour 18 at the hospital. Uh, this is a healthcare worker taking her nap um, covered in her PPE. This moment to me very much spoke to this pretty universal exhaustion that many of these healthcare workers were experiencing. And I just came upon this woman as I went into the lobby at two in the morning. This is Maria Alarcan looking at her son, Gabriel Flores over video chat from Mexico. Gabriel's mother hadn't seen him in over 20 years. He came to this country as an undocumented person and they weren't able to see each other for a very long time. 
she was eventually able to enter the U.S. Um, but tragically, she didn't make it in time uh, to see her son while he was still alive. I connected with Gabriel's family when his oldest son and his wife came to do a visit. Sometimes families were granted a visit uh, when the hospital staff and the physicians knew that a patient was at end of life. Uh, they granted something called a compassionate visit at that point. And I met his son and his wife, and I talked to them about the work that I was doing, uh, and they permitted me uh, to work with Gabriel and with the family during this period. And I tried to somehow capture Gabriel in this moment, and what ended up feeling most appropriate was only seeing a part of his eye uh, in the way that's illustrated in the image on the right. This is Gabriela Flores, Gabriel's wife, speaking with one of the doctors about her husband's condition. This is the Guerrero family, as they see Jose Guerrero after his passing in the ICU. Carolina is embracing him and their daughter. Marisol is behind her. I want to share a little bit about the process of gaining consent, uh, which is fundamental to this work for um, documenting a moment, the most sacred moment imaginable like this. After they gave me permission to photograph um, this final visit with their father and their husband of many years, I went to their home and we discussed the publication of this photograph. Sometimes we wonder how it is that a particular image ends up in a publication and that image is deeply painful, deeply intimate, and in many moments, very hard to look at. But the family agreed that it was really important to share the rawness and the reality of the disease in a way that people truly understood what was actually going on in the hospitals at this point. So my approach was to go to Marisol and discuss the publication of this image. And because they felt comfortable, I felt comfortable as well in their decision, we moved forward with this image being published as part of the story about the patients in this ICU. This is Daisy Morcia. Daisy was a very special person. I wanna take a minute to talk a little bit about her. I met Daisy in this triage tent. Um, I was photographing, this was an area where people were gathered who had COVID-19 related symptoms. And I was photographing, it was at the, at the end of the day. It, I was actually at the hospital longer than I was supposed to, you know, they permitted me to be there longer than, um, than I was supposed to be because I had just had this feeling that I should stay into that evening. And I heard a voice and it was hers. And she said, oh, you're taking pictures. And I said, yeah, it was a very upbeat voice, something that was not common in that tent or in much of the hospital at that point. And she said, you should take a picture of me. And I was really struck by this outgoing effervescent voice. Most of the time in any circumstance, we rarely get people who just outwardly volunteer, let alone someone who's dealing with COVID, who's uncomfortable and who's facing a hospitalization. So I photographed her. And when she was moved into the second tier of, of the hospital before moving into an actual hospital room, I sat next to her in this dimly lit room, everybody else was asleep. And she whispered to me, um, we were meant to meet. And she told me, uh, you're my only visitor. And there was something about the clarity at which she spoke and the understanding of who I was in such a short period of time 
was so profound. And she gave me a gift in that moment because she gave me a reflection uh, of my role, not just in her experience, but more generally, my only visitor. We are often the only visitor. We are often the only person who will address the elephant in the room. We are often, even before a pandemic that placed journalists and documentarians in the position of surrogacy like never before, we hold a role in people's lives and that doesn't manipulate the truth, it enhances it and it makes it clearer. Because people then trust us when we're actually human beings with them in this very human bond. Because people know when you're real, when you're sincere and when you're actually committed, they know who you are. And in that moment, I was reminded of that truth when Daisy told me, you are my only visitor. And after she passed away, I contacted her family on Facebook and they invited me to her home to be able to look at photographs of her and learn more about her. And we've continued to be in touch over the past year and a half. Um, and I hold dear the kind of value that they placed in the time that I spent with her in the last days of her life. This is one of the final visits between Gabriel Flores um, and his son, Manuel. This image resonated, of course, very deeply um, with many people. It was published in the Times as part of this larger story. And it really spoke to, um, for so many, the profound trauma that the last two years has created generated and has caused such a profound form of complicated grief um, in that everything that we understood about grief and bereavement and even this notion of closure was completely overturned um, as we navigated the last few years. I spent time with different providers. Um, I tried to address some of the roles that people play in a hospital that are often overlooked, for example, this is BJ Brown Jr. Um, who risked his life every day for the last two years uh, in his transportation work in the hospital. He has a nine-year-old who knew about the contagion and the infection risk and he, she would call him every day during work to make sure that he was okay. I shadowed a number of funerals and I shadowed the funeral of Mr. Serrano and Mrs. Serrano. I happened to connect with this family because they attended the same church as Mr. Virgen. And it was important for Sherry and I to be able to walk through every form of grief and ritual during this period to really understand what these families were enduring. This is an image of Gabriel Flores's body being moved into the morgue. I spoke with Manuel before I went down and I accompanied Gabriel's body to this final place before his funeral. I wanted to make sure that it was okay with them to be able to move through the hospital uh, with Gabriel and also felt that it was very important to be able to follow um, his journey through. About a month after leaving MLK, I started working on a story about ECMO, a last resort therapy uh, for people who are not responsive to any other form of treatment, um, people who desperately need another option to be able to heal. This program is very significant at Providence St. John's and they have done tremendous and extraordinary work in helping to save lives that no other institution has really been able to do. This is Dr. David Gutierrez, who in December of 2020 contracted COVID and became gravely ill. Um, he, his life was saved as a result of ECMO and Sherry Fink and I were able uh, to follow him over the course of six months. This is Dr. Gutierrez being taken off of ECMO, um, which was a profound uh, 
celebratory moment. This is his daughter showing pictures, family photos through the window. Diane Gutierrez. Three weeks into shadowing people at St. John's, my dad became critically ill, not with COVID. He became critically ill um, after a series of very serious mistakes within the healthcare system. And suddenly I found myself in the position of a daughter navigating a healthcare system full of injustice, full of detached responses, and often not a lot of empathy. A strained system, a system that often categorizes people based on race, age, and gender, and limits often their pain. When my dad became critically ill, I walked through the hallways of the hospital that he was in, which was only five miles where Dr. David Gutierrez, Gutierrez's hospital was. And I was struck by how I was in many ways walking through a very similar situation that I had just been documenting for so long. And the day that my father passed away in the intensive care unit, I saw how the doctors walked towards me and I knew in that moment that he had passed away because it was the same way that the same figures had walked towards the families that I had just been shadowing a week prior. I knew that it was over and I was devastated as a daughter and as a witness. And I went into the room to be with my father's body in a very similar way of what I had just photographed a month before with Mrs. Guerrero and her daughter Marisol. And I stood by his bed and I watched my mother lean over his body this way. And I didn't have my camera, but for some reason, I took out my phone and I took this photo. And in that moment, I didn't really understand why I was doing this. Why would I want this horrendous memory preserved? And the reality is, is that sometimes to be able to understand, we have to preserve and we have to remember. And that erasing is annihilating and removing the possibility of transformation after grief. So after I took this photo, I realized that it was of immense importance to me and to my family and to my dad, because it was saying to me in my grief, look, this actually happened. This is real, I saw it. And that makes me deeply grateful to have been able to be there not only as a daughter, but as a witness as well. A few days after my dad passed away, Sherry Fink and I received notice from the Gutierrez family and from the staff at Providence St. John's that Mr. Gutierrez, Dr. Gutierrez was going to speak for the first time in four or five months. He had been mute and as a result of multiple medical uh, interventions, intubation is very traumatic on the vocal cords and he couldn't speak at that point. I was really torn about going back into a hospital environment. I didn't know what I would feel. I had just lost my own dad. What would it be like to go back and continue to photograph other people's fathers and their critical illness? I thought about it for a few hours and I knew that although I was a grieving daughter, I was and would always be a journalist. And I knew that I had to go back because it was my responsibility to see this story through. So I agreed and I went in and I was a witness to one of the most joyous moments where Dr. Gutierrez spoke. He said hello to his wife and he said, I love you for the first time in six months. 
In this image, you see Melissa Peters, who is a speech therapist at Providence St. John's, communicating with Dr. Gutierrez. And here you see Dr. Gutierrez and Diane and Dr. Gutierrez's wife visiting him. His wife was, of course, overwhelmed with emotion. At this point, um, his fate was still very unknown and the precariousness of being in this uh, critical state uh, is so very delicate. He made it home and I was able to share in a Father's Day celebration shown in this image. It was deeply moving to be able to see his homecoming and to be able to let all the love in his life sink in after seeing him in a deeply medical context and battle for so long. I wanna close with um, a few images from an ongoing project that deals with youth who were impacted by critical illness and their young nurses who have cared for them. When the Delta wave arrived at Providence St. John's, I was really struck, uh, overwhelmed and deeply distressed by the rate of young people who were hospitalized for critical illness. I was seeing a hallway of people in their 20s and 30s, and I knew that I had to, to help tell their story uh, and to share um, their struggles uh, as well as their transformation in, in some situations as well, their healing. And I knew that I wanted to be able to honor their nurses who happened to often be the same age as them because their nurses often saw their patients. I mean, they're so deeply invested in everyone and are such an example in, of, of radical empathy and, and, and connection the way that they have to build intimacy both with patients and families while navigating the patient's care and navigating a, a staff of other healthcare workers and a, a large hospital. So I, I knew that I wanted to be able to show that these nurses felt very much a heightened sense that these young people were a mirror to them. But also I really wanted to tackle a question that I had in the face of my own grief about who lives and who dies. This is a deeply mysterious virus. It continues to be, and we still have many unanswered questions and we may never have the answers that we want. This is Jenna interacting with Jessica, who was a 32-year-old visual artist from the San Fernando Valley. Jessica was known for drawing at the local brewery where she was really popular. She was a very beloved sister and daughter and creative person. Angie Kim and her father died of COVID within weeks of each other. Angie died in somewhat early phase of the pandemic. She was 30 years old. She was a beloved social worker who was dedicated to working with at-risk youth. She was very involved in her church and was known to, for making trips abroad uh, to create accessible homes for children and adults with disabilities. She was known very much for her servant's heart as her sister, Kathy, who's shown in this image in front of a memorial on the family's piano at their home. Manny uh, was 26 when he contracted COVID and they believed that he wasn't going to make it based on the severity of his illness, but he was able to seek treatment at St. John's and receive ECMO. Um, and after a few months, he was um, able to recover and is now looking for a job. This is a, an image um, from a young woman who was 24 years old, Hanny, a very special young woman who was about to become a nurse, uh, but contracted COVID and passed away in the fall of last year. These are nurses gathering during a break, um, taking a moment of silence and reprieve. And here is Manny uh, 
receiving attention towards the end of his hospitalization. This is an image of some of Hanny's friends singing at her memorial. In this process, um, which has been lengthy working with these families, I was reminded of humility in this process because often the families um, took a lot of time to respond. I gave them a lot of space to make a decision about whether they wanted their young loved one's memory to be a part of this project. So it was a very heightened um, kind of delicacy, as one can imagine, a true sacredness in, in working with these families, uh, given the profoundness of their loss. And this is Hanny's room uh, at her family's home in the desert. So I want to remind everyone that it is our responsibility to be in these bedrooms, to be in these spaces, to be able to participate uh, in bringing just a glimmer of grace to these situations, to these families, to these communities. We are so deeply privileged to be let in. While this work may be very challenging emotionally, it's so important to remember that the people who are doing the most work are the people who we're shadowing. They are doing, performing a Herculean task of opening their hearts to us. And that is so profoundly precious. So in a field that can be very challenging and daunting, it is most important at the end of the day to remember why we are all here. And I am certainly here for the people who have allowed me into their lives over the last 16 years. Thanks for listening and I'm looking forward to questions. Thank you so much, Isadora. That was um, profound and beautiful. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for listening. Really, really moving. Uh, we're going to take some questions. If you have questions, put them in the chat. Uh, we have one already, but I just um, wanted to say that um, I think your approach of um, the sensitivity, the empathy, uh, the bravery as well is an exemplar of how we should be doing documentary work. Thank you, John. I really appreciate that. Um, so Adrian Catanese asked, uh, said, sadly, we've seen lots of diminishing of the deaths of quote, older unhealthy individuals. Yes. Were you thinking about this injustice while shooting the project? Did your own experience as a cancer survivor connect to this issue? And finally, do you think that America has gotten better about not minimizing the lives of older or ill persons? The mm -hmm. same or worse? Uh, and <laughs> There's a lot of questions. Uh, what do you think of our nation's current attitudes towards COVID and vulnerable populations? So really wonderful question, set of questions. <laughs> a, lot, a lot to move through and I appreciate the thoughtfulness of the question and, and drawing attention to, to older people. So sadly, I don't, it's, it's, it's hard to assess at this point because as far as I'm concerned, we're still in a pandemic. I still know people who are immunocompromised, who are older, who are still sheltering in their homes. I still know that many skilled nursing facilities have not resumed a lot of activities. And I still know groups of seniors who are not venturing out into their communities and their lives have been uh, unchanged um, based on comfort level or health status. So it's hard for me to say, um, you know, we're out of it and hold the perspective. Uh, I do think we have a propensity for amnesia in the United States when it comes to suffering. I saw how we were able to move so quickly, uh, although understandably, to understanding and covering and um, 
following uh, the horrendous Russian war on Ukraine. Uh, but the reality is, is that these families are suffering every single day from profound loss, grief, and trauma. Um, and moving away from calling attention to them uh, disturbs me greatly. I do feel a sense going back into the hospitals in the last couple of months that healthcare workers are feeling forgotten. You know, they were once uh, heroes with capes, um, and they're feeling an increasing sense of invisibility and a return to marginalization as everybody moves back into, um, you know, maskless happenings. I think that generally, no, I, I don't personally feel that our understanding of the um, nuance of aging and the nuances within older communities has changed much as a result of the pandemic, because I'm continuing to hear people talk about COVID deaths. And then after disclosing to me a death saying, well, this person was older, as if that changes something, right? Um, we're talking about a human being. We're not talking about a statistic. Uh, we're talking about an essence, not a condition. And it's, it's, this is a person. And to just then follow by saying, well, they were older, or they had a comorbidity, is to deny the reality that they shouldn't have died. This shouldn't have happened. These people should still be here. This is uh, an inhuman injustice that I think many of us are having a hard time facing. And maybe a big part of that is that it's just so close. And I think we all have a propensity to not want to sit in the discomfort, to not want to sit in the grief. We want to, uh, we want to forget. And a lot of my work and a lot of the conversations I'm having with many of these families around ways of sharing this work is about how do we continue, how do we not let people forget? And, and how do we continue to honor um, and be of support to people who have experienced traumatic loss in the last two years. And in terms of my own health journey, it certainly informs my understanding um, of the healthcare system. And I will say that you know, while I'm inspired by uh, the people who I shadow, uh, by creative works in other mediums, by storytelling in general, I'm very much inspired by my own history. It has very much guided who I am. Uh, my own traumas and my transformation and my survival has helped guide me in understanding the survival and persistence and um, deliverance of many of the people that I've shadowed. So I think there is that understanding, even if people don't actually know a lot about me uh, on a factual level who I'm shadowing, they feel it in the energy and they know that there's a mutual understanding. So I think. Uh, whatever has broken your heart will probably help you connect with people who you're shadowing and it will become a great gift to you. Um, although in moments it might be, it will feel like a profound burden. Thank you. We have one more. Um, do you have any advice for uh, uh, documentary photographers who don't have bodies of work or credentials to gain access to stories? So for people who are early in their careers. Now, of course, you also started early in your career, but what's your advice? How do you gain access? And, you know, because that's also a critical part of this. You gained access in ways that no one did, literally no one in the United States. So what, what is your advice? I think that's a, a really great question. I don't think not having credentials should stop you whatsoever. I think in moments, uh, sometimes people are eager to work with a photographer who might not have a certain established background um, and they might be interested in you because you bring something to a story, to a situation. Your, your, your personal interest, your passion is really important to share with people uh, when you're trying to work on a story. And I think um, your personal reason uh, the compass that's leading you to a particular story is enough of a credential for you to be working on it. You don't need to have some kind of established publication or body of work on the topic to be fully invested and start on that journey of becoming very connected to an issue or a community. And I started um, my career as a teenager and people, people gave me a chance that to this day, I just wonder and mystery how that even happened, right? I moved in my late teens to Romania 
um, after receiving the support from the Spotlight Foundation. And I did a project in a youth prison and I was 16. Sometimes you send out hundreds of emails and there's someone in Southern Romania who's sitting and reading the inbox and says, why don't we let her come and do this project? Uh, or, you know, a, a year later in New Mexico, when I entered a juvenile detention center, I had, I had no established um, publication or, or knowledge of where the project would go, but they were interested in having me. So you'd be surprised. You'll find your, um, your soulmates, so to speak, uh, one way or another. And I think it's just about finding um, and following your heart in these projects and not feeling limited by maybe not having a certain precedence in an area. Just uh, go for it. And if you have the right reasons for doing the work, it will work out. Yeah, and, and you know, just having observed you do this work, this persistence, right? You, you don't take yeah. no for an answer. You mentioned you probably wrote 60 emails and yes. was turned down 59 times. Yeah, yeah, you have to you have to keep pushing um, and really relying on intuition and that persistence to, you know, of course, if someone doesn't want to be photographed and it's a no, it's a no. But when it comes to institutional access, yes, I've been very persistent with people and often even working, um, you know, often I am shadowing people who have um, histories of complex trauma and that affects you know, trust relationship with others and sometimes I work with people and the process is really slow and I wait for them to invite me in I just show my presence over time and we communicate but sometimes I don't photograph you know within the first few months with some people so I think it's about adjusting and, and understanding the needs and sensitivities of the person or people you're working with Okay, one last question. Um, uh, Yu Yu uh, says, uh, Hi, Isadora, thanks for sharing the images. You often work in a sad and difficult environment. I believe you must be very emotional when you photograph. Is there anything that you would do to make yourself feel better after taking the photos? Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk a little about self-care and Sure, yeah. I mean, I've definitely cried behind the camera while working. Um, that happened in the hospitals quite a bit in the last few years when I photographed uh, Gabriel Flores's last visit with his family and, and the moments um, in one of the visits when his son Manuel was embracing him. You know, I was crying while taking the photos. So it absolutely affects me and it would be scary if it didn't right uh, i think we're moving away from this um detached uh white supremacist heteropatriarchal understanding of, of of storytelling and and embracing the fact that it's okay to feel uh when you're moving around in the world and and helping to um, be a conduit or a vessel for these stories so self-care for me looks uh, not great a lot of the time, but I am, um, you know, really committed to uh, taking time for myself uh, when I can and connecting with friends um, and um, doing carefree activities, occasionally riding roller coasters. Um, I am fortunate to, you know, live in California and have access to a beach. So being around water, you know, finding activities that are, bring you joy are really important. And also accepting that you're powerless over other people's pain is a really important part of this work. You can't change their circumstance, but you are doing everything you can in your role to honor their experience. So at the end of the day, even if you feel defeated because you just watched a family completely fall apart, you at least know in your heart that you did what you could as a storyteller to share uh, their experience in the way that they would want it to be shared. Okay. Thank you so much, Isadora. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I hope for those of you who couldn't share your question or would like to connect to, uh, please send me an email. Um, if you search my name on Google and go on my website, my email is right there. 
or feel free to reach out to me on social media. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing from you and I really appreciate the opportunity in, in sharing my work this evening. Thank you. Thank you. And good night. Thank good you, night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you so much. Thank you.